I'm weirdly excited for a talk about audit, audit metrics at this time in the afternoon. We've, we've seen enough deep technology. Now I want to like actually understand how to communicate with management effectively. So the, the, timing is, the timing is very good. So before we kick this off, as always, I'd like to thank my sponsors, especially Uptix. Uptix helps you, helps you quickly identify and eliminate security observability gaps. Whether your challenge is related to cloud workload protection, cloud security posture management, XDR, or all of the above, Uptix has you covered. Learn more about uptix.com, U-P-T-Y-C-S.com. Please welcome Joe. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon. And uh, you'll see here a second name on this presentation, Alex Schulman. Uh, she's not able to be here due to personal reasons, but I have to give her credit for the help in developing this. Uh, she's a brilliant champion of cloud security, so I want to make sure she gets her due. And of course, thank you to everyone putting their effort into CloudSec and all of the sponsors. This is uh, a uniquely amazing event. Housekeeping first, uh, disclaimer, anything embarrassing I say or do is not the fault of Ernst & Young. Uh, so. <laughs> um, so what we are noticing within the industry is everybody in this room who has a technological or an engineering background, there's really nothing I can tell you that you don't know about how to secure the cloud. Uh, if you take a, the, the traditional framework of governance uh, and, and centralized data protection that's required for all of the organizations that are highly regulated, and then you take the new, which is the need to be agile and uh, be quick with cloud, there's a huge gap that persists there. Uh, and the gap that exists really is that we are often subject uh, or captive, if you will, to more traditional on-prem metrics of measurements for security controls that do not translate well when describing our overall maturity rating uh, and certainly when we're reporting to the board. So what EY is doing is we're working across the board with organizations to close this gap. Uh, and, and, and the way that we're doing that, of course, is by bringing all of the aspects of the cloud not just engineering, which I know we'd all love to just focus on engineering, uh, but the reality is there's the technology, the people, and the process. And we cannot have one without the other. There is an interdependency in cloud. It is a cross-functional security effort. And so the more we understand that and the more we drive our metrics based on our understanding of that, the more we'll be able to get uh, the proper communication and the support we need from our board and our managers to make sure that we're getting funding, to make sure that we're able to continue uh, with our, our individual projects. So there's nothing really here uh, that you haven't seen before. We all know the access uh, and enablement. Uh, we know prevent, detect, and respond. Uh, to make progress on our, our challenge will be adjusting our processes and training new or training teams to do new uh, to absorb new functionalities uh, we can start the process by bringing visibility to our progress hence the need to have metrics and kpis that uh, are, are better aligned to cloud so uh, we're, we're let's start with the typical organization uh, the structure is is very similar for regulated clients across the board all three lines of defense are, should readjust their roles to provide data that supports the metrics that drive our maturity. Um, in order to do that, we need to, as engineers, understand the importance of the second and the third line, right? So outside of tools and frameworks and automation, what do we get from the risk, uh, risk management and governance? and what do we get from control assurance to make sure that we're asking the right questions. Using these questions, of course, is paramount to driving forward with metrics that correctly and adequately identify our, our maturity level. So let's talk about key metrics through each of the lines of defense. Uh, we should adapt to report the most important data to uh, executives and decision makers. For example, uh, what percentage of our resources are controlled by policy as code? 
what percentage of resources maintain consistency and compliance through deployment via an IAC pipeline. The engineer's delight, of course, uh, guardrails, how many services are protected and automated to uh, against prevent, detect, and respond for each CSP service. Uh, this means our KPIs need to adjust from the traditional work of making sure that things are uh, patched to something we've all been talking about for a decade, but for some reason no one's actually doing. And that is, instead of saying how many of our machines are patched, let's report on how many don't require patching. Let's get away from pets and move to cattle uh, and move towards what we've all been saying for a decade. Like I said, this is not new. We all know it exists. We all know we're supposed to do it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, but we're not there yet. And so we need to drive that adoption. And we need to make sure that that's a new metric that is being reported to the board because the executives, the, the decision makers within an organization likely don't understand why that's of value and how that helps us achieve our goal of both being secure as well as taking advantage of agility and speed and deployment, repeatable deployment in the cloud. These are just some vulnerability management metrics that we should be using to actually drive our metric creation uh, and certainly where we should be getting data. Obviously, the visibility and scanning coverage prioritize and manage metrics on high risk. Uh, you should have a dashboard where all of these things are being reported and based on your internal uh, policies, you can assign your, your own priorities or use one of the uh, traditional frameworks uh, to do so. Obviously, scanning lifecycle and gates, tagging and auto-ticketing. Uh, tagging is something that's very new and often understated in the cloud if you don't understand the cloud. And certainly, redeployment and speed of automation. So driving towards zero trust implementation uh, is another way that we advise our clients to move towards uh, proper metrics for measuring their security maturity. The main reason for this is, number one, the industry is headed towards zero trust, and number two, this encourages all of our clients to apply multiple layers of security and controls at each level of each CSP service. So traditionally, we had uh, the, the traditional approach to this was we had IM and we had uh, network segmentation. It's not necessarily network and segment and I am or network segmentation and identity and access management anymore. It's a much higher degree of security. And what we want to get people saying is today I'm I am and network, and zero trust implementation is an implementation of all controls across all, go all co services without the assumption of trust on any other domain. And the metric that we should measure, ultimately, is the blast radius uh, or the lack of, uh, of control over blast, blast radius as a result of any of these conditions. So these are some of the required controls. How many of these are you going to need data from? That's up to you and your organization, and that's really going to be up to what your, your policies and, and guidelines tell you. However, I can tell you that industry-wide, what we're seeing is that we need as much data as possible because it's not just about taking the data and taking the metrics and taking the percentages to the board and the decision makers. It's about making sure that they understand why and they will ask why. So we need to have the data to back up why because things have changed in the cloud. This is a conceptual zero trust architecture. Um, all of the controls are in place around the different levels, uh, different, different domains, and certainly the different layers of the environment. Uh, obviously, we put data at the center because when we're talking about zero trust, data is at the center. Everything else is just interacting with that data and therefore needs to have the proper controls and proper configurations to moderate access and secure the data. Uh, obviously, the, the other thing to think about here is that when we talk about assets in the cloud, what is the main asset that will always exist in the cloud? It's going to be your data, because much of everything else in the cloud 
will be ephemeral. And so the one thing that is consistent will likely be your data. This is a, a simple example of how you can derive metrics. These, some of these are very uh, traditional, and we can take them, and we can turn them into more updated and more uh, meaningful metrics. So taking something like encryption, uh, we can say, instead of worrying about the mean time to detect or the mean time to respond, which is still a measurement that you should have for uh, people trying to, to gain access to a key or manipulate your key, uh, what you want to do is have controls around the number of controls that ensure immutability of your encryption keys and the number of keys created using the approved templates and processes versus those that were created as a spin-off. You know, someone needed to log in and do something quickly as a stopgap, and now it just exists out there. We all have those. Um, and certainly the number of keys that are auto-rotated. We need to get cloud to a hands-off state, and that hands-off state includes the more automated controls, the more auto-remedial controls. How many of these controls ensure that in the event that a key is created or misconfigured or misassigned, that key will be isolated and ensure that nobody has access to it? These are all new metrics that need to be designed and defined to adequately report to the board. Network is another one. We all, I, I was discussing network earlier, um, network used to be the segmentation and the identity access management, and that's how we define zero trust. But zero trust can't simply be identity as a uh, contextual analysis and subnets, and, uh, and it, it has to be an all-inclusive uh, approach to this. And so what we do is we say, how many of these VPCs are peered? How many of these VPCs are peered cross uh, cross-segmentation or cross-project, uh, how many of these machines can talk to each other uh, between individual VPCs or projects, and how many individual users have cross-project or cross-VPC access. And the way we do this is through all of the tools available to us, cloud native, all the third party, um, uh, obviously the asset management, being able to print out a list of identity and access management roles and who has access to that. Um, but this gives us an overall topology, and we can't really define what our blast radius is if we don't actually have that picture of what's talking to what. Additionally, we had a client that we recently did uh, some work for who had an internal policy that said absolutely no VPC peering, period. And so they had VPCs peered as approvals, but it was counting against their security maturity because they didn't have a process in place to ensure that the VPC approvals were not counting against them. These are approved peers, and you should have the, the right quantification, the right metrics to show that these are approved, not illegal peers. So what we did was we talked them through a tagging strategy where you can put a tag uh, where you get the approval, and that links to a database that then does uh, all the cross-referencing to make sure that it is a valid uh, a valid connection, and then that tag includes the approval. And so if you had one that didn't have that tag, then it's obviously not a, an approved peer uh, or an approved connection point between VPCs, and that would allow you to then delineate between which were approved, which were not, how many were in violation, how many were not. Thus, it increased their security score. So by not understanding how these things are important and how to deliver these metrics, and how to define these metrics, they were actually costing themselves points when actually reporting this information to their board and to their decision makers. So this is a really impor important point, excuse me, uh, that we need to make when we're talking to clients and redefining the way that we do things uh, in the cloud from an audit and security maturity perspective. This is just, again, samples. Um, a lot of this will be things that, that you're familiar with, um, SSO, federated access, but there's more that we need to think about in the cloud. How many of these controls were created through an IAC process or an approved process versus how many were, were created on the fly using the CLI? How many of these, uh, how many times have we stopped an attempted change to a role or a permission? Uh, how many times have we, over the last uh, several months, 
uh, seen changes to the, the time, the length of time that it takes to onboard or offboard an individual. These are all metrics that need to be measured in combination with things like remedial automation that then goes in and undoes any unsanctioned changes to permissions. This goes back to what we said earlier, a decade long talk that we desperately need to stop having, stop patching your cloud instances. Please stop patching them. <laughs> it will make everybody's life much easier uh, and it will give you what you need to be absolutely agile uh, and secure at the same time within the cloud. The, the number that you should be measuring, the percentage that you should be measuring from a vulnerability standpoint is not how many instances are patched, it should be how many instances how many workloads, how many resources do not need patching? This is really, um, this is very high level and it's for illustrative purposes only, but this goes to the fact that we need to also def, uh, redefine the way that we're giving, uh, we're scoring security controls. So across all three domains, uh, preventative, detective, and response, you wanna have different controls layered against each service. And the impact needs to be rated as either low, medium, or high. And the low being user awareness training is something that is pretty traditional, still has a very valid uh, role to play in the current, uh, current environment. Medium would be, of course, our detective controls. Uh, not gonna go in too deep on those. Uh, but then you get into the automated controls, the policy as code, the immutability of resources, and that's where you should be getting the most points because ultimately we should be striving for automation, hands off, zero trust policies that then uh, are implemented at an elastic scale against our cloud environments. So this number is just off the top of our head. It could be much higher, it could be much lower. Depending on what service you're actually working with, there's probably a number of controls that exist for say VMs uh, that don't exist for something like a managed service like Dynamo. So you wanna make sure that you're counting all and configuring all of the controls that you have in place with a, uh, an effective way of scoring those. Um, so this is just a, a fact. Cross-functionally, engineering, architects, and the risk and control uh, risk, and risk management group, incident management group, uh, everybody within an organization cross-functionally needs to come together and design the best cloud control systems. Everything you put into a template, just a simple template uh, from, from an IAC uh, template design perspective has multiple hands on it. It has the encryption team, uh, it has the architecture team, it has a network team, it has the identity and access management team involved. You cannot operate in silos. So those need to be defined and redefined to match what we're actually doing and what we're trying to do in cloud. The business then, because we are all cross-functional and we're all reporting properly and because we're operating in a way that makes us more uh, agile, makes us faster, makes us more elastic, then we, the business can operate securely in the cloud without any concern, taking full advantage of what the cloud is supposed to be. The cloud is supposed to be about agility, rapid expansion, and uh, security ultimately. Because even though it's secure, insecure to a certain degree by definition, we have the ability to make it secure. So now next and beyond. The first thing is that everybody who's sitting here needs to be demanding of their organization that they shift towards a more secure, cloud-adjusted and sustainable process. Whether you're an engineer, whether you're an architect, whether you're in the, within the audit team itself, you need to be working within your organization to drive the adoption of a better measurement framework for your audit. Um, you need to invest in education uh, something that is not happening in most organizations is new teams or old teams are being asked to pick up new skills without fully understanding uh, what their, re their responsibilities and the skills needs will be for those roles. So ideas like policy as code, zero trust, 
those are lost on a lot of individuals who are trying to transition from what their old roles used to be to what their new roles used to be. Obviously, we want you to adopt a data-driven approach for cloud risk management. Data coming from all the security services, cloud native, third party, the people and the processes, that is often not uh, something that is categorically captured in these audit results. Uh, and we want you to, to consider adopting a zero trust as a risk management and audit philosophy. Zero trust, again, means application of security and controls at each layer of each cloud service. And then invest in long-term cloud controlling. Drive enablement, modernization, automation is going to be key. Advocate for a contemporary cloud architecture. Drive innovation and enterprise modernization towards more secure and sustainable processes. That means everything you do should be built now, looking forward with the idea that things are going to change and things are going to change rapidly in the cloud, and you're going to need to be agile enough and dynamic enough to adjust and adapt to that. And Ernst and Young thanks you. <laughs> I thank you, and I am happy to take any questions. Thanks, Joe. Uh, a couple questions. So uh, one, there were probably about 45 to, to 60 metrics that you showed on the screen. Uh, so what size team, like how would you structure the, the team that builds and collects metrics like this? This is a, that's a pretty hefty program for, uh, for, for certainly for smaller organizations. It is, yeah, and I think a lot of it's going to be driven by what uh, industry you're in. Obviously, if you're in a very highly regulated industry, financial services, healthcare, you're probably going to be up there in uh, having more of those metrics to define. Uh, if you're more of a social media platform where you're not involved in something like, like the heavy regulation, you probably don't need that many. So a lot of that will be defined by that metric alone. What I would say is a lot of this needs to be captured as well by what we're seeing currently with third-party vendors where they're integrating with cloud platforms and they are better capable at keeping up with the changes to APIs, the availability of APIs, and making sure that they are capturing things out of the box that help us close those gaps uh, as part of their service. So I guess that brings me to the question of like, where do these metrics typically feed into? Is there a, a BI dashboard? Like, how, wh where do these things go? What's, Absolutely. The, what's the recommended place to store these? Absolutely. You should have a dashboard that captures real-time metrics, uh, adjust your scores accordingly based on the environment at any given time, uh, and that information should be readily available to anybody who has an active, or who is an active stakeholder in cloud so that they understand their, the security posture. Without, without picking favorites as a, as a as a neutral vendor, is, is there a, you know, is there a metrics platform that you feel is especially suited for this? Should, should we use CloudWatch metrics for this kind of thing, or is this something <laughs> that you know, no, we need we need Looker or something more more complex? No, it's going to take a, a combination at this point, and probably some some specialized engineering depending on how deep you want to go into these metrics, uh, especially if you're a cross uh, multi-cloud and uh, hybrid cloud deployment. You're absolutely going to need multiple tools and then be able to pull that data together into something. And so, you know, given that, how do people keep these systems, you know, updated? How do they, there's quantitative metrics about cloud security uh, quality. You know, wh where do they feed into? Like, what's the, what's the update posture for this? Is it a, a process, a tool? Like, what, how does that work? Yeah, I think it's probably a combination of both. Uh, you need a tool that captures high priority and uh, or the priority level of any of these and ensures that they're getting remediated uh, in a timely manner. But there also needs to be a process there for who to connect with. Uh, it was kind of interesting going right after Yoav who mentioned, you know, you need to have these processes in place, these databases, who's the owner of what so that you can get in contact with who you need to. Um, but the, the long-term strategy should be also that what you get in contact for is to say it's been remediated, yeah. right? That's, that would be ultimately the goal, okay. depending on the priority. And so, you know, I think this room is an easy sell for zero trust metrics, for immutability, for those things. Um, but we, many of us work in, in organizations that still have plenty of on-prem engineers, not just auditors uh, familiar primarily with on-prem environments. And so do you have any sort of tips or tricks for getting them to understand and see the value of these metrics absent uh, 
uh, top-down mandate to go zero trust or, you know, air quotes, go zero trust or something like that? Yeah, I think, I think the main thing is that uh, you don't want it to be a mandate, right? You want everybody to come to the table, and I think the way you do that is not only by explaining to them the value, uh, but also by bringing them to the table to help you plan and evaluate and define these metrics and educating them as to why these metrics need to be, the, giving them the data and giving them the background. And I think that's what's missing right now within most organizations is there's just a lack of communication and a siloed work process taking place that needs to be addressed. So, um, but that makes sense. Let's maybe working backwards then, uh, you know, looking at, at Alexi's uh, question from Slack. What are the organizations that have done this successfully, that have, you know, jumped over the, the chasm uh, to get all the way to zero trust automatic remediation? What do those organizations look like? What distinguishes them in their structure and operations from their peers? Um, I would say the vast majority of those, and I have yet to see someone who is 100% there just being completely upfront. I would say that those who are born in the cloud uh, are probably the closest. So those are the ones that are making the, the jump easiest to understanding how to use cloud and how to use automation and remediation effectively. So will this solve itself through time as people who are not born in the cloud eventually leave? Is that, is that basically what we're stuck with? I think it solves itself through time, but I think it also solves itself through advocacy. I think okay. every one of us has an obligation to go back and make sure that we as engineers are asking the right questions and bringing the right data so that we continue to get support for what we are doing within the organization. Makes sense. Um, and I guess uh, last question from John. Um, lots of KPIs shown in the slides. Can you recommend any sources for where we can source other examples of these KPIs? Like, Published um, these slides. The, the I know CISA, CISA published a zero trust maturity model. Like, wh wh where do you where do you go to source out metrics like this? Yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot of it just comes from personal experience across the industry. Some of it comes from obviously established documentation from cloud vendors and third party providers. But I'm happy to to share these slides. And uh, uh, but reality is, a lot of this is going to come from experience, third party providers, and cloud vendors. Cool. Anyone else out there? All right, well, thank, thank you very much, Joe. Thank you.